I am so excited to be able to welcome all of you to this wonderful presentation. Um, I'm Barbara Dixon. I'm on the, the board of the Penn Session for years ago. And so I'm going to do an advertisement for I introduce that. <laughs> um, the Princess Weekly Reserve is an organization that supports the reserve, <coughs> and we do this sort of programs, for example. We organize the program and, and invite a dog and ask him anything. Um, <laughs> you can just volunteer. And so you can invite to join, and here's a bookmark if you'd like that. <coughs> for some reason, my voice is um, Doug Moore is somebody I've known for years. The way that I met him was, I was doing a project on campus, and I needed photography badly so I could get a grant for the project. And I had no money, naturally. And so I mentioned it to and he said, sure, I'll be happy to spend half a day. Come and take pictures of all your high school kids. And he took the best pictures ever, and I got grants for that program for the next several years because of Doug's fabulous photography. So thank you for that. He's a generous, kind person. Um, he's also been a rock out as his advertisement on Facebook and in our shooting materials I told you since he was just a little kid. Um, and diapers, he convinces me since it was 50 years ago. Apparently, it was in diapers. <laughs> Um, he has some formal training in geology, and also um, he's worked a little teaching geology here on campus. But your job in which you retired was in media, right? Right. But you also have great seminars in geology and art and the sea. Natural resources. Oh my goodness. So I was a naturalist before I did this other stuff. Too. So all of the above. Right? All the allergies. Yeah. So thank you so much to Doug and welcome. Thank you very much. Do you want to brush it? Uh, has everybody filled out a door prize form? Okay, good. Megan will take care of it if you haven't. There's a bunch of rocks on the back, and the door prizes will. Take a drawing for that at the end of the program. The program is only four hours. It'll be a, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and that's why there's still some snacks left. So if you still need for a brownie or a juice, bar, or a Coke, they're back here. Right. Uh, and also, some of the people, the youngest, I'm sure, particularly brought a rock. Did anybody bring a rock that hasn't been identified? Oh my gosh. <laughs> well, all right, now let's take a look at a couple of them, then I'll do my program, my slideshow, and then we'll have the drawing, and then you can take a look at all this stuff up here. You can handle these rocks, but don't move them from the label, then we're all in trouble. And there's a couple of rocks that I have here at the minerals that are encased in protective plastic. Why? Because this one's arsenic. arsenic. And uh, this one is asbestos. Okay, so I, I don't have them where you can lick them. Uh, you can lick this one. We'll kill you. Just lick it. You want to do it? Okay. You lick it, tell me what it is. It's salt. Salt is a mineral. Uh, okay, let's see. Who, who has a rock that needs that one? Okay, let's do this one right here. Oh, that's very cool. Well, there's actually a rock up here that looks like that. It's called violite porphyry. And porphyry is when you have crystals floating in a fine grained matrix. Violite is a type of lava that's high silica. Remember Mount St. Helens? Well, the older folks do it. <laughs> 30 years ago. And that lava is very thick, it's like peanut butter. It has a lot of quartz in it. And um, we have a lot of ancient volcanoes and lava flows up north of us that generated this, uh, this type of rock. So you have wildlife porphyry. Where'd you find it? Uh, on the beach, um, we glacial tilt. Yeah. Chambers Island. Okay. And you can find it in the gravel around Stevens Point if you're going to get arrested for stealing gravel. We'll see this, this stuff. Okay? Let's do another one. Young man. What you got? Okay. 
All right. Did you get this from Nixon Mound? Okay. Um, because there is a place in Wisconsin where the Native Americans made uh, scrapers and arrowheads and this kind of thing, tools, out of this stuff. It's quartzite. So uh, you start with, sands, uh, start with sand, and it gets pressed together by Mother Nature enough that it becomes sandstone. And if it gets pressed even more, it just takes a long, long time, millions years maybe, then we have quartzite. So that's what you got. It's quite a uh, very hard rock. Anybody been to Rib Mountain? Uh, and Rib Mountain is made of quartzite. And Granite Peak is not made of granite, it's made of quartzite. <laughs> so, you know. All right, let's take a look at one more at this point. Oh, oh, look at that. Wow. I have one just like that. It's still in the box. Oh. Yeah. And what, anybody know what this is? It's like yours. It's, it's a porphyry, but not right like this is a... Uh, uh, and this, excuse me, <coughs> andesite uh, porphyry or uh, dye-based porphyry. So we name it after the, the rock in the background, the fine green rock. And these are crystals of plagioclase feldspar floating in it. So it's not a, it's not cobblestones. These are crystals. It's an uh, igneous rock. Nobody really knows how porphyries are formed, but uh, they're pretty cool. Where did she find it? Um, Lake Superior. Lake Superior. Okay. Yes, we do porphyry hunting in Lake Superior. I've done some free diving in six feet of water to get big porphyries. And uh, well, she watched. This is my wife Susan, by the way. She's a rock hound also. We will may, may deny it, but she we went to a rock shop, a friend of ours, uh, a couple of days ago, and she bought three huge rocks and took them back. One more we'll take a look at. Young lady, what do you got? Wow. Okay. This is the most common rock on the planet. Uh, it's made of silicon and oxygen. Silicon dioxide. Anybody know what it is? It's got a hardness of seven. It's what sand is mostly made of. No idea? Quartz. Right. Exactly. Where'd you find it? We don't know. Okay. <laughs> it's, there's a lot of this in Portage County. Very nice. Uh, uh, let's see that. Okay. <laughs> don't laugh now. Oh, wait a minute. Don't laugh. Where'd you get this one? Italy. Okay. Uh, I was going to say it looks like. Um, Pumice, but it, I don't think it, I think it's schist. Mm -hmm. and schist is a metamorphic <coughs> rock. When you take shale, mud rock, and Mother Nature presses enough heat and pressure on it, it turns into schist. So right? metamorphic means changed. But that's those sparkly things of mica. Yeah. And there might be some that something else, and there's a black mineral, and that might be black. It looks like black and white mica. That's very cool. Italy, huh? Yeah. Wow. All right, one more. Uh, yeah, back there. Oh, oh that's cool. Any idea what this is? It's got sharp edges. It has conchoidal fractures, like a conch shell. It's sharp. The Indians used it to make arrowheads. The Americans. It's chert. Right. Chert is like flint, only it's not quite as translucent, so you can't see through it. Very nice. All right. All right, I'm going to go forge ahead and, and try not to bore you too much and uh, tell you a little bit about the uh, crazy hobby of rocks and minerals. You know, my right, my voice starts cracking. Uh, I got the same thing, a little uh, allergy that Dr. Dixon does, but I'm trying not, not to. I brought some lime, uh, lime and water. We'll see what happens. I got a demo I want to show you, but I'm going to do that after. Uh, we get a slide stuff. So let me kill those lights. Do I have control here? Come over here. Oh, yeah. Okay. So, rocks, minerals, fossils, agates, and crystals. So, uh, one of the things that we get involved in is collecting. So, the geologists who study the earth and uh, earth forms, this kind of thing. But there's also rock hounds that collect materials. And we think that rocks and minerals and crystals and fossils 
are more interesting than some of the other things that people collect. That's just a personal opinion. But the neat thing about rocks is most of the ones we have here uh, are thousands, probably millions of years old, and in fact, a couple of them are billions of years old. And a lot of them, people don't know how they form. Uh, so they're very old and very beautiful in many cases. And you also find that rock hounds come from all across the spectrum. In our rock club here in Central Wisconsin, we have a rocket scientist and a brain surgeon. And rock hounds, are they weird? Well, they're just different. <laughs> That's all I'll say, they're different. Uh, this is my son who just turned 33. <laughs> I'm not sure what he's doing. He's supposed to be collecting uh, got a diaper on. Anyway, in a gravel pit. It's hard to get the gravel pits anymore like I could do when I was uh, about his age. But uh, anywhere we can find rocks that we can pick up and not get arrested for, we'll, we'll keep an eye out for them. So there's a lot of things you can do as a rock or mineral collector. You can make jewelry. You can do the beading. You can collect just one thing like garnets or trilobites. You can carve material. So there's all kinds of uh, niches, shall we say, within the hobby if you pick one. You can just pick garnets and collect garnets for the rest of your life and take you to some beautiful places around the world and never get bored. You, some people collect meteorites. Now they don't look for them because, oh, I look for them. They don't find them usually. They're hard to find. You usually end up buying them. This one actually landed in Sweden in 1905. It weighed a couple tons. It spread over 10 square miles. It's a million years old. And it, the reason we know this is a meteorite is made of nickel and iron. It's got this cross hatching called the Widmannstadt pattern. So there's different kinds of uh, meteor, meteorites. The one that most people know of is the, is the iron nickel one, the heavy one. And if you cut it, you'll find this Widmannstadt pattern. So some people collect sand. We have a friend at the Rock Club who has 600 varieties of sand. Some are made of this material here. This is like superior. Most of this is quartz. Somebody had quartz. The clear ones are quartz, but there's other rocks in the sand. Quartz, 99%. She also has garnet sand and sand from uh, peridot, this green sand from Hawaii, sand made of shells from from uh, France. So you can just collect sand. Sand is rocks too. Question? What's the magnification on that? Uh, well, those are large sand grains, but you can see them with the naked eye, but they look like boulders here, so a little bit larger than most sand grains. Also, moving up in the scale, people collect tiny minerals. It's a lot cheaper and a lot easier and not as heavy as the 300 pounds I brought today. They're called micromounts, and you, there's a whole bunch of people with these micromounts of rare minerals. They take pictures of the microscope and do that, or they can collect mucha. Uh, Jasper from Australia. This was at uh, the biggest rock show on earth, which is in uh, Tucson. Look at those cars in the back. These things are bigger than cars. I don't know who buys them. I don't know how they get them moved from one place to the other, but uh, they're all lined up. Huge. You can also collect fluorescent minerals. And when you hit, hit them with a black light, particularly a short wave, you get this. So some minerals fluoresce. And I'll show you what I mean by this a little later. You can collect fossils and the juxtaposition of um, life and minerals. Then we get fossils, petrified wood. In Wisconsin, lots of fossils. And uh, this is a, an abandoned quarry that we got into. And Dr. Kelman, here's the brain surgeon, is whacking away, trying to get the fossils out of that rock. So when I think about collecting rocks, unlike collecting beer cans or stamps. Uh, it takes you to so a beautiful area. Here's what with my wife Susan uh, along Lake Superior in Canada. Uh, so a lot of beaches are great places to find rocks. Particularly I have beaches in the Midwest because we have the glacier that drag all these rocks from all over the place and dump them. Uh, as we speak, there are people mining Thunder Eggs in Central Oregon at the Friday at the Richard Recreational Rock Ranch, which is 20,000 acres, and uh, the plume Thunder Eggs are amongst the most valuable Thunder Eggs in the world, and it's because you have to burrow into solid hard pan rock to get at them, and then you got to cut them. There might be a duck. I was in a 
agate mine in Germany. There are a few mines you can go to, not too many. This is more of a show mine. And here's people collecting thunder eggs uh, in a mountain in Germany. If you go to Oregon, you can find lots of thunder eggs. And I was collecting also in March in between the vineyards to find agates. They're called scolazite agates. So you can go to some interesting places. A lot of people like to cut and polish or make jewelry uh, of their specimens. We use a diamond saw. If you don't have the money to buy uh, a fancy rock saw, you can get a tile saw at Menards for about 50 bucks and do the same thing. <laughs> a lot of people, after they collect these things and they find how difficult it is to find a great specimen, they go buy specimens at rock show. So here's a friend, Rudy Lucy who's from Switzerland at a rock show in Germany. They're selling a lot of agates. Here's uh, our people at our rock show in Marshfield, which happens in early May. I left some of the post, uh, postcards and flyers uh, from that, uh, postcards from last year, but you feel free to grab some uh, help promote the hobby. And here's Susan at a rock show in Oregon. Uh, a lot of rock shows have tailgaters. They have people outside <laughs> open with the truck beds and stuff that they sell. So anyway, rock shows are fun and they're ones all over the Midwest, all over the country, and all over Wisconsin. So people say, well, how do you know where to find this rock or that rock? How come I can't find this uh, in Plover or Stevens Point? Where do I look for it? Well, it's, he it's helpful to know something about the geology. So if you know something about the geology, then you kind of know what you're going to expect. If you go out to California, they have different rocks out there. If you study the geology, uh, you'll know what to, what to look for. So we have bedrock, a rock that you don't see here. It's under, underneath us in some cases 50 feet down, some cases uh, two feet down. But this is the basement rock that's below us that uh, forms the foundation, basically. And there's a lot of different types of rock. The uh, dark green stuff in the Minnesota in northern Wisconsin and UP area is the old uh, volcanic rock. Then we look at the bedrocks, the bedrock geology of Wisconsin. We see up the green and red Christmas colors. That's the old stuff and the Wolf River Bathlet is a huge flood of uh, volcanic rock that's very thick. That we're, I'm actually on part of it right now. The uh, tan area in the middle is a lot of sandstone and limestone. And then there's limestone uh, over in Door County along the uh, right side. Anyway, a lot of that bedrock you're not going to see unless you're lucky enough. If you go out west, there's rock everywhere. The bedrock is right there. But here it's buried under glacial debris. The glaciers came down and bulldozed and dumped sand and gravel and boulders and rock. And in many cases, it's a couple hundred feet thick. Sometimes it's a dozen feet, but that means you don't see the, the bedrock. So here's the glacier, just like ice cream, only two miles thick, oozing. And as it moves south, it uh, bulldozed rock from Canada and northern uh, parts of uh, the different states, and including Wisconsin. And we have these lobes of the glacier. So if you find a rock in the gravel pit or in a gravel deposit, uh, that doesn't seem to belong to Wisconsin, you can think about what glacial load dragged it from probably in Ontario, Canada, or up in Upper Michigan. That's where we find copper and a lot of the uh, gravel deposits around here. Even in Stevens Point, they find pieces of copper. The copper came from up in the Upper Peninsula, so the glaciers ripped it out of the bedrock and dragged it. Well, let's talk about minerals a little bit. Minerals are chemicals, basically. Anybody taking chemistry? If you know your chemistry, you'll make a good mineral collector because uh, it's all chemistry. So these are natural occurring chemicals, uh, compounds. There's about 5,000 of them, about 200 common minerals, and about 20 that make up our rocks. We'll talk about rocks in a minute. So I want to go in too deep in chemistry because somebody might realize that I took chemistry about 50 years ago. I don't remember that much. Uh, except that if you knew no chemistry and the affinity of different elements for each other and comp compounds and the molecular weights and this kind of thing, then you can figure out why this uh, mineral exists. 
So for example, we took, took a look at the piece of quartz, and the top percentage of weight percentage of the Earth's crest, oxygen and silicon, and then to a lesser extent, aluminum, iron, calcium, sodium, potassium, and magnesium. That makes 98.59 percent. These two, when you put them together, you get silicates, you get quartz. So quartz, all the silicates are basically the make up the most the bulk of the Earth's crust. And we've classified minerals by their uh, anion. So you have uh, lead sulfate. The sulfite is the sulfate, or the sulfide, or the oxide is the anion. And uh, I don't want to go into this too much, except that there's a lot of silicates. You can see on the right side, there's native elements that are actually you can find a pure element, uh, not more than not uh, two or three, just one, that occur in nature. And then you have all these other anions. So, for example, you look at a beautiful mineral. A lot of these are museum specimens I photographed. I don't own these, but uh, they're, you know, it's like you want to have a beautiful example of some of these things. This is dioptase. It's copper silicate. So we've got copper and silica. Remember silica? Uh, it's from silicon. It's from Namibia, which used to be called German Southwest Africa. Here's crocoite. I put these in because they're glaringly beautiful. Uh, it's a bright red mineral, and it only uh, not the only place, but the most popular place it occurs is in Tasmania, and it's lead and chromium. So it, it's a chemical, basically. Here's a aragonite, calcium carbonate. So that's. Uh, Calcite, basically, is one of our most common minerals, but when it's in crystal form, it can get quite beautiful. In baking soda, that's calcium carbonate. Here's another one that I've seen, I don't have a specimen of this, but I've seen it in other museums in Europe and here. Pyromorphite, lead chlorophosphate, so lead, chlorine, and phosphorus. So, the, again, the chemistry uh, leads you to a better understanding of the minerals. You may have seen azurite and malachite in rock shops or gift shops. The blue is the azurite and the green is the malachite. These are copper carbonates. So carbon, oxygen, and copper. And this one I have up here, but these ones I saw in two, some big ones. Those red are rubies. They're not the kind you can make a ring out of. They're more of a coarse ruby, but it's, it's ruby, which is aluminum oxide and zoocyte, which is a type of uh, mica, actually, the green stuff. And it's found in different places, including Zaire and India. So crystal chemistry, basically what we're saying is that the, when you see crystals, you're seeing a reflection of the, the minerals, the, 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 the chemis chemicals, the atomic structure, and all the chemical uh, relationships that exist and in the physical form. So, let's take a look at galena. Galena is uh, the reason that they call us badgers, because they first started mining lead. And galena is lead sulfide. The lead is the principal uh, ore of lead down in southwest Wisconsin. And you notice the shape, shape of those crystals? They're square, right? Cubic? And if you look at the molecule of galena, you see the sulfur, yellow, and the, the PB, which is lead, they form a lattice, which is a cubic. Not only are the crystals cubic, but when you smash that thing, just like table salt, all the little pieces will be cubes. So that's the cleavage, but it's also crystal. Sometimes those are different. Here's one called kyanite. It's beautiful. We were collecting kyanite in northern Wisconsin three weeks ago. It didn't look quite as beautiful as this, but it's kyanite, and um, it comes usually in a metamorphic rock with garnet and quartz. And when you have pressure and temperature, this is a phase diagram, so here's kyanite, and this kind of pressure and this temperature. If the temperature gets higher and the pressure's then you have another mineral called andalusite. If it's higher temperature or high pressure, we have sylmanite. 
So what I'm trying to say is you put pressure and temperature uh, on, a on a mineral and it can change something else. So it's called a phase diagram. So we have elements that occur naturally as, as rocks or minerals that we find. Here's one that if you've been anybody been up to the upper peninsula, the copper mines, this is one of the few places on the planet where they have pure copper. I got a piece of here. They used to mine copper on half the size of this room. Uh, they called it the mass load. Then they went on to load the, the smaller pieces. But the mass load, they had to use a chisel. Two guys with, a, with sledgehammers, and one, the company would only pay for one uh, uh, illumination, one candle, and one guy holding the chisel. And he would tell him to stop by putting his thumb over the end of the chisel. <laughs> There was no OSHA back then. But anyway, copper, native copper, is still found in Upper Michigan. They don't mine, the mines are off those. And sometimes it was mixed with silver. And the mine captains say, hey, give me that white stuff. That's no good. When you say that in the mine, give me that white stuff. That was silver. He knew what it was. They didn't know. Native non-metals, well, I've got one right here. Bright yellow. Anybody know what it is? Sulfur. Brimstone. You know what brimstone is? Sulfur. In the Bible. And sulfur is, uh, as occurs as a mineral, the crystals, usually when there's been a, um, a volcanic eruption, there'll be sulfur deposits. You get too close to a volcano that's uh, active, you get some of that sulfur. You know what happens when you put, combine sulfur and water? You get sulfuric acid. Are you? I'm sorry. Pardon me? Well, uh, when you, you get a sulfuric acid actually, but obsidian is another thing we'll talk about. All right, metallic minerals, there's oxides uh, like hematite, that's iron ore, uh, bauxite, aluminum, uh, calcite, there's samples of all those up there. Here's magnetite, and what do they call magnetite? Magnetic. What do you think it has in it? Iron. In fact, the highest, uh, the richest ore of iron is mag magnetite. So we have these major mineral sweets, sulfides. There's one that we talk about mining sulfides because they're a metal and sulfur. And when you have water that gets in and and uh, oxidizes those, then you end up with sulfuric acid. Sometimes that gets into the river or lake and becomes a pollutant. And uh, I was uh, in Tucson, these, are, these come from Morocco, and they have some real big ones, and man, those are heavy. A lot heavier than a regular calcite geo. Here's one called peacock ore. It's, I got a piece up here, it's very pretty. It's an actually ore, they actually mine this for copper. It's got copper, Iron, this is a chemical formula here. It's got copper, iron, and sulfur. So another sulfide ore. Very pretty. Sphalerite is another one that was mined in Wisconsin, and that is zinc sulfide. I have a couple pieces in, in the door prize and a couple other pieces up here. Rhodochrosite is a beautiful mineral, and it's pink usually. It's actually manganese carbonate. A lot of the manganese minerals are pink. The other one is rhodonite. Uh, you know, ro means red, and I think Greek or Latin. Anyway, uh, rhodochrosite, a lot of these things are actually found in Wisconsin, but not in huge quantities. Uh, this guy, Doc, Dr. Cordula, over at River Falls, you know, River Falls, retired mineralogist, he put together an atlas of all the minerals in the state. And you can look that up on, you can Google it and see all the minerals. A lot of the ones that we've seen here actually occur in Wisconsin. What's his name? Uh, Cordua, C-O-R-D-U-A, Dr. Bill Cordua. Uh, one thing you may find if you look around, you'll see uh, limestone and <coughs> usually limestone with these little tree-like things. It's actually a manganese oxide or pyrolusite. We call these pyrolusite dendrite. Dendrite means trees. So we have um, different chemicals different ores, different metallic min minerals out there. So let's take a look at some of the non-metallic halides. Well, 
You did the halide test, didn't you? <laughs> Sodium. And we have fluorite. You, we get this is the main ore of fluorine. What are we exploring for, by the way? <coughs> Toothpaste, among other things. So fluorite comes in many colors. A lot of times it's green or blue or yellow, sometimes clear. Uh, this is selenite. Gypsum. What do we use gypsum for? Drywall. Plaster. Um, and it, selenite comes in many, many uh, configurations. You've seen that cave of swords in Mexico, they have huge, huge crystals? That's selenite. It's calcium. And barite, that, the actual piece is here. Barite is also has a high specific gravity. It's quite heavy. And we use barium for a number of things, drilling, and some uh, medical procedures I won't go into. <laughs> Calcite is one of our most common minerals. It's a fairly soft mineral. It reacts to acid. So if you put a little soda pop on there, it should fizz. And it, uh, this is dog tooth spar. This is the crystals. Calcite has many shape, different shaped crystals. Appetite, I know we make jokes about this. Appetite is a, comes from a, a potto, I think is a Greek word meaning chameleon. Appetite comes in so many colors. It's uh, fairly hard, but not as hard as quartz. And this particular one comes from Madagascar. This is what your bones are made of, appetite. There's another appetite crystal from Maine. So it's a calcium phosphate. There's your Again, this, if you know your chemistry, you'll learn your minerals pretty quick. There's calcium and chlorine, chlorine, phosphate. So rock forming minerals. Most of them, silicon and oxygen, the silicates make up the vast majority of the minerals in the Earth's crust. And they have these polygons or tetrahedrons that link to each other in, in the atomic structure to form different minerals. So we have tectosilicates, quartz and feldspars. That's what they, nobody's actually seen those, but this is what they surmise they look like. And there's quartz, and they're quartz crystals. <clears throat> and if you, and feldspars are like quartz, they use the curve of quartz and granite. Somebody, a couple of uh, youngsters had granite here. That's one of the main minerals in granite. And this is another phase diagram. I don't want to confuse you, but. The, you have calcium feldspar, sodium feldspar, and potassium feldspar. And which one you've got depends on how much of it is in this diagram. So I've got uh, Labradorite, which is the moonstone over here. That's uh, half calcium, half sodium. Um, and then I have some uh, focal place feldspar, the orange stuff, uh, over here. That is uh, potassium feldspar. So it's all chemistry. That's my, my point. No need to memorize this for the test. There will be a test. Just kidding. Okay. Well, there's a, a pink feldspar. We have a lot of them. A lot, a lot of you can collect feldspar the rest of your life. Sunstone, moonstone. Those are feldspars. And, uh, and it's beautiful stuff. It's fairly hard stuff. It has a certain texture. A certain when you turn it in the sun, you see these lines. Um, and so we, there's a certain texture that we have. Here's Wausau moonstones, labradorite, and orthosite, and I can't explain the physics of it, why it flashes. I've got a piece of labradorite from Madagascar that you'll see, and it has the flash. It turns blue-green. Beautiful. But that's a feldspar. So we have sheets. Anybody know what kind of mineral comes in sheets? You peel them off? Mica. Mica. Mica is one of the three minerals in granite. Usually it's just those so sparkly flecks like you had in the schist. Mm -hmm. I've got some pieces of mica, different kinds of black mica, white mica, purple mica. And because they have the sheets, they have certain chemical bonds. It all goes to chemistry and the, and the internal structure that allows them to be peeled off. And we have black mica or biotite mica. We have white mica is muscovite, made from Moscow. They still use this in electronics, and 
If you're an old timer, you may have a pot belly stove. I used to have one that had windows made of this mica called Eisenglass. It's a rock. It doesn't burn. So if you put plastic in there, it melt uh, as soon as you start the fire. The pitolite is lithium mica. I think this is a major ore of lithium. Purple, I've got a piece of it up here. Serpentine. Now we start talking about these uh, materials that are uh, minerals that are uh, fibrous. And then we have asbestos. And the fibrous and asbestos allowed it to be used, uh, they could be woven into cloth, made into fireproof suits. Only trouble is they found out later that we had uh, these fibers get in your lungs and give you mesothelioma. So we don't use asbestos anymore, but it was a rock fiber that was impervious to uh, fire. So we have epidote. It's another type of um, material here, another mineral. You usually see a green mineral. You see it in a lot of the granites, usually of the vein. And it's a sorosilicate. And you have then another arrangement of tetrahedra that gives you the kyanite, the olivine, which is the green rock, and the garnet. Garnets have a certain crystal shape. And this is the almondine garnet, the most common. This one's about the size of a baseball, but they come much smaller. And there's the same pieces up here, olivine, peridot. If you go into hot to Hawaii, they have beaches made of peridot. It comes out of volcanoes. Then we have the chain silicates. And these are dark rocks that are crystalline. There's a lot of them around here. They're hard to tell apart. They're the flashy dark crystals you usually see in some of our igneous rocks. So one of them is hornblende. And the other one is augite. And they're really hard to tell apart. But you have dark flashy dark crystals in a rock. You'll probably see that. How do you identify these minerals? Well, obviously color, but sometimes color is not the answer because uh, a lot of things are the same color, the green or the blue. Uh, streak, hardness, specific gravity, a lot of different ways you can use to deduce. Sometimes you'll na nail it the first time with one specific uh, attribute. Rose quartz, it's quartz, so it's hard, it's got a certain hardness to it. And it's also pink color, so we know what that is. Also has a luster to it, the texture on the surface. You can see that how the light bounces off of it. Streak is another thing I'll show you. You use a piece of tile, plain tile. Um, in streak, for example, a piece of hematite, which looks silvery, it'll be red. So you basically think of a powder, a powdered material. And so that's another thing you can streak uh, just to tell, uh, and help to tell what it is. Hardness. So orthoclase feldspar hardness is six. It'll it will scratch a knife. A knife will scratch it. Uh, but quartz will scratch it. And its hardness is seven. And then we have the hardness scale from one to uh, diamond. One talc. That's what you get talcum powder from, and diamond is the hardest. Actually, the difference between 1 and 10 is about 10,000 times. So it's 1,000, it's 10,000. So a diamond is much harder. Talc you can scratch with your fingernail. I've got some soapstone off here, that's talc. And then we have different minerals uh, that are different uh, hardnesses. These gemstones, the diamond, the corundum, which is ruby and, and the epi, uh, emerald, uh, are pretty hard. Topaz, quartz is hard. Calcite, gypsum, uh, not so hard. You can use a penny, a nail, um, so on and so forth to tell the hardness. So if your fingernail, if your fingernail scratches it, it's less than 2.5. That'll, that'll eliminate a lot of things you think it might be. A knife blade. <coughs> it's six. Well, here we are scratching a rock, and it turns out to be a piece of limestone. <coughs> a little knife blade. And it scratches it very easily. 
We also have density, how heavy it is basically, compared to the weight of a similar volume of water. So air doesn't weigh much. Air is right up at the beginning. There's air. Then you get quartz, that's 2.65. And then, at the other end, you get things like gold, and mercury, and uranium, and iridium, which is the heaviest, densest material on the planet. So uh, that's the specific gravity, the density. That's something you look for. It's just, it feels heavy compared to what you expect from something, some other material. And then crystals, if you, anybody taken geography or geo geometry yet? If you're good at geometry, you'll be good at crystallography. I get a little confused, but if you have a crystal, sometimes you don't, you can tell what the mineral is. And there's a lot of different crystal systems. And so if you're going to be into minerals particularly, you will learn about crystals. These are quartz crystals. They're hexagonal, and they're topped by a prism, a six-sided prism. If you're lucky, you'll get doubly terminated ones. So there's a prism on the bottom and the top. And you'll see doubly terminated different minerals if you're lucky. And then, quartz comes in so many forms. This is scepter quartz crystals, and crystals upon crystals. And uh, some people just collect quartz crystals from all over the world, all these different forms. It's, it's unending fun for you. <laughs> and then amethyst is a type of quartz that has been colored by hematite. And then we have calcite. Calcite is polymorph. It has several different crystal shapes. The most common is the dog tooth star spar. It looks like dog's teeth. But there's other shapes. So here's dog tooth spar. If you're looking, I've got one up here. Uh, you can see them. This guy right here is a buff full of dog tooth spar crystals. Calcite. It's calcite, pretty soft rock, and it will dissolve in acid. And here's some doubly terminated dog tooth spar crystals. This is the museum. And here's calcite crystals covered with dioptase, another mineral. And here's calcite crystals coated with hematite from China. So you can't always tell by the color, can you? Can I look at the crystal and the hardness? And here's a red crystal, uh, compared to this one. That's red crystals, but that's something different from rhodochrosite, which is that pink rock I showed you, that pink mineral. It has crystals, if you're lucky. The best crystals are found in this mine in Colorado. Then you can also get these rhodochrosite stalactites from Argentina. Uber expensive. <laughs> this one is in a uh, German museum. But people cut slices of them and use them for jewelry and stuff. This one's uh, pretty, pretty big. Beautiful. So uh, minerals come in different forms. Here's rhodochrosite, the pink, and sphalerite. Sphalerite is the zinc sulfate they used to mine in Wisconsin, the zinc ore. They occur together because of the chemical affinity. So cleavage, no jokes now, is how a rock breaks. And so you look at something like calcite, you can see this kind of square square thing, kind of triangle. That's the cleavage. If we broke that, we would get a rhombohedron. It's sort of a twisted uh, cube. It's sort of offset. There's an Iceland spar, a calcite rhombohedron, and they call them Iceland spar because they're perfectly clear. You put it on a line and you have a double line. But that's, a, uh, that's the cleavage of calcite. We saw the dog tooth crystals. So the crystals are one thing, but the cleavage, the way it breaks, is another thing. <coughs> Here's fluorite. Fluorite generally has crystals of them. They're cubic. You can see all those cubes in there. But this is the octahedron. And there's guys in China that sit there with octa fluorite and break it in these octahedrons and they take it to Arizona, then I buy them. <laughs> but that's the, that is the, the cleavage, that's where it breaks. And I had a piece of rock here, I can't show you right now, it's here. I thought it was calcite, but I deduced that it is actually fluoride because of the 
cleavage and all the products, it doesn't react with potassium. So fluoride comes in different colors, and uh, yellow, purple, and green are the usual ones, aren't all clear, but blue and yellow also. There's trace amounts of some other element, and they'll uh, give it the color. Here's a crystal of mica. Remember we told mica comes off in sheets? But it actually has a crystal. Look, it's a book mica. They call it book because it's stacked up like a book. And that's the white mica, the file silicate. <coughs> Not a crystal, but the sheets. And galena, we talked about lead sulfide, mined in Wisconsin, principal ore of lead. So let's talk about rocks. Rocks are mixtures of minerals. So uh, you think of a stew. You've got hamburger and tomatoes and pasta, and somebody throws in hot dogs. What? Uh, you've got a different kind of stew, you call it something different. Same thing with rocks. They're differentiated by the places they form and the minerals that are in them and the size of the grains or crystals. So you have granite with a big crystal, we give it a different name. So rocks don't have crystals, but they're minerals. And here's one of these phase diagrams. So what do we tell them? It's not as scientific as the minerals because you don't have the pure compound. But we got quartz, we got one kind of feldspar, another kind of feldspar, another kind. The mixture that you have of these different ferns and what you got, trachyte, phonolite. Tephrite, dacite, rhyolite, it depends on the uh, components. So we have a number of different kinds of stews we could make out of all these components, and every time we have a different composition, we have a different name for the rock. These are petrologists, the people who study rocks. Here's another one, the dark minerals, olivine, peroxine, hornblende, and the amount that you've got of each of those determines uh, what you're going to call that rock. And if you're really going to get scientific about it, because a lot of rocks that looks like hornblendite, I don't really know. If I get a geologist trying to determine exactly what it is, you cut a thin section, um, a very thin section, and you polish, I'm talking razor thin, and then you put it under a petrographic microscope with cross polarization, cross nickels they call. And then you look at these, hopefully you know what these look like. So this happens to be a feldspar here. But if you're a trained mineralogist or petrologist, you know this is feldspar. And you go through that whole thin section and you count the percentage of feldspar. Or quartz or whatever it is. That's how they tell exactly what it is. If you want to get really deep into it. I don't. But I do think these, some of these... Uh, thin section are, are beautiful. This is actually a fibrolite, which is a hornblende rock Greenland. So, we have igneous sedimentary metamorphic rocks. In northern Wisconsin, we've got a lot of igneous, the dark rocks. You go up there and you look at on the, on the gravel around the Walmart uh, or uh, McDonald's, you see a lot of dark rocks. Uh, that's the igneous rock. A lot of rhyolite, a lot of basalt, a lot of epidote, that green stuff. And the sedimentary rock, the vast area, uh, is um, sandstone and limestone. And if, we, if you go across on Highway 29, you see all that sandstone near Eau Claire, sandstone bluffs. So the igneous rocks are, are fire rocks that are made uh, volcanoes and magma and lava coming up from down deep in the earth, molten material that later cooled and crystallized, or didn't crystallize. <clears throat> we had talked about rhyolite porphyry. Uh, that's porphyry where they get crystals floating in a fine grain <coughs> matrix. And red granite, our state rock. <laughs> Wausau and black and white granite. Granite has feldspar, mica, and quartz, and you can change it. It looks different color, but it's the same constituents. And we have diorite. If we have a little more the dark rocks, a little less quartz, we call it diorite. Sometimes you just have to make an educated guess. <coughs> if you get big
big crystals of mica, feldspar, and quartz call pegmatite. A lot of times in pegmatite, other things come out. I've got a friend in Rapids who is a professional mineralogist. He's found 50 different rare minerals, rare earth elements in the pegmatites up in Wausau. Zircons, for example. Here's another pegmatite. So if you see big feldspar, big quartz, big mica, sometimes you'll see other things like tourmaline and gemstone. On um, California and Maine, this is where they occur. They occur in the pegmatites because they cool slowly. We have something called Rapakivi granite. You see a lot of it around here, where it's basically a feldspar porphyry, a granite porphyry. These things here are crystals of feldspar. <clears throat> if you read Gene LeBurge's Geology of Lake Superior, he'll tell you how that formed. There's two kinds of feldspar. But it's very common. This actually went out in the parking lot. I put a label on it. Cyanide is granted without the quartz. So you just get the feldspars and sometimes horn blend. Here's one called Unikite. Actually, the, the, the state rock of Virginia. And it, it makes a nice gemstone. It's just made of epidote and feldspar. Two things we've seen. So these are all rocks. They're mixtures. Gabbro, a lot of the dark rocks we have. Sometimes a little light in them, but usually dark is mostly gabbro. And porphyry, we've seen. I've got the actual specimen up here. Crystals floating in a fine grain matrix. Here's a big crystals and a diabase matrix. Then we have sedimentary rocks, water made rocks. Somebody already showed us a nice piece of shirt. <clears throat> and limestone, which is sedimentary. We call it limestone because it is uh, calcium carbonate, same thing as calcite. And then metamorphic rocks have been changed by heat and pressure. And we have zones of metamorphic rocks called Barovian zones, the metamorphic facies, an assemblage of minerals that occur under different pressure and temperature. A lot of stuff we have, we go down the river out here. I don't get down the river by the mill anymore, but they have some of the oldest rock in Wisconsin. It's nice, G-N-E-I-S-S. -S. It's metamorphic or was granite and recrystallized into layers and <clears throat> forms by heat and pressure. And we have mica schist. We've seen a good example of that already. <clears throat> eclogite is a couple of really neat rocks. One is eclogite. It comes from way down in the Earth's mantle. And it's a combination of garnets and jade. Very pretty rock. Very rare. And I have a piece of kimberlite here. It's the dullest looking rock on the table. But kimberlite, does anybody know what kimberlite is famous for? Right. It's named after Kimberley, South Africa, where the diamonds uh, are found. <clears throat> this came from the Upper Peninsula. And this kimberlite comes from 280 miles down, <clears throat> shooting up from pipes, shooting up to the earth. And when it hits carbon, Change it to diamond. It's the only rock, the only material on earth to find diamonds. And they have kimberlite up at Crystal Falls, outside of Crystal Falls, Michigan. There are micro diamonds there, you need a powerful microscope to see them. There's 30 other minerals in that thing. But it's the dullest looking rock on the table, but it's one of the most interesting. 280 miles down. Fossils. Uh, very interesting. And you can get into collecting fossils and Find fossils around here, Wisconsin. You won't find any dinosaur bones. This is from Utah, agate dinosaur bone. But uh, <clears throat> we had dinosaurs here, but the, the the environment wasn't the right environment to preserve their remains. We also we do have a lot of corals, especially in Dor, Dor County. A lot of the limestones, a lot of fossils. So a lot of corals, chain coral. <clears throat> called halocytes. Petrified wood, we have no petrified wood in Wisconsin. We have some wood that was quasi-petrified during the glaciers, but it's not really turned to rock. It's buried, called Two Creeks Buried Forest. But out west, there's a lot of petrified wood. You've all been heard about the petrified forest in Arizona. I have a couple pieces. I think one of uh, the door prizes, one up here, is not taken from the petrified forest, but this the surrounding private land. We have this rainbow wood. And we have things like cephalopods, ammonites, trilobites, 
That's the state fossil Wisconsin. That one's from Morocco. That one's from Ohio. And crinoid stems. Anybody seen crinoid stems? It looks like stacks of poker chips. And uh, it's got a little thing in the center, a little carved out. Actually, is the stem of a sea lily. And it's not really a lily, it was a, it's a relative starfish. Uh, Tosky stone is a coral from Michigan, Devonian age coral. If you really want to have a lot of money, go to Tucson, you can see these beautiful ammonites that opalize shells. I saw another one with $200,000. I mean, it's huge, it's, it's a work of art. Mother Nature's work. And also this gem dinosaur ball. Every cell has got an agate in it. And jewelry makers love this stuff. And this is a primo piece that uh, I used to buy some on eBay cheap, and now it's way out of sight. But it is beautiful stuff. Agate dinosaur ball. So finally, my favorite stuff is agates and thunder eggs. And a lot of the agates form in air bubbles and lava rock. Coals big oil because they're almond shaped. <coughs> Here's some from the bottom of Lake Superior. These are Lake Superior agates that never got hit by the glacier. And they're still in the basalt, in the bottle. And they're almond shaped. <coughs> and a lot of these are these are migdal oil, Greek for almond. Here's one in Germany, you can see it's almond shaped also. This sets the way the uh, air bubbles are formed <coughs> in the molten lava. And we have uh, lake Superior agates, think about, think about lake agates, each one is different. And these agates could all form, have formed in the lava, inches from each other, but they're all be different. So uh, unlike diamonds, which all look the same. And this is made of duckle quartz. It's all quartz, but it's got usually iron to, to change the color, and it's a fiber. So it's fibrous quartz, unlike the quartz that we have up here. And uh, that makes agates interesting. There's some people like Jeff Anderson, who is a deaf mute, and has a master's degree in geology, working with the Smithsonian. He sells every kind of agate you can imagine at rock shows around the country. And here's the biggest agate in the world is uh, Brazilian agates. Uh, he's a friend in Germany, building a big one. I've seen him the size of a Volkswagen Beetle. If you go to Walmart, you can actually buy agates. And you see them in many gift shops around. These are dyed. You see these garish colors? Those are Brazilian agates, the biggest agates, the most plentiful, the most plentiful agates in the world. And Germans learned how to dye them back in the 1870s. I'll just show you a few iconic types of agates. Uh, it's Kuchki Gorni, Poland. And uh, Argentina has some beautiful agates. These are all museum quality. I don't know, I can't afford to, but I have a couple of rich friends in Germany who have the best collection in the world. Uh, Moroccan agates, a lot of varieties, and just beautiful. Four works of art. There's a lot of agates in Scotland. And in Australia, particularly in the Agate Creek area around Queensland, another green color in this particular agate, it's, a, it's unmistakable green, comes from nickel. Most of the green agates you see, which are quite rare, it comes from iron. Laguna agate is the Cadillac of all the agates that found in Mexico. Back in 1940 on Highway 40, you could pick them up on the surface. Now, you can't. They dig them. Of course, you want to go to Mexico without an armed guard. Nevertheless, lately, in the last few years, these fighting blood agates came. This friend of mine in Germany has the best collection. In fact, he's got a book coming out. It'll be defeated at the Denver show in September uh, on these uh, fantastic flame blood eggs. Every color rainbow. People thought they were fake when I first saw them, but their people have gone to German friends in, are in China right now collecting them. Then we have our Lake Superior agate, unique because it's the only agate you really don't have to cut. And because the glacier abraded it, you see that's not the whole rock. That's part of the rock. The glacier ripped it out of the basalt and rolled it around and bulldozed it. And so you're seeing the pattern. Most agates you have to cut them with a diamond saw or hit them with a hammer to see what's inside. <coughs> That's the biggest one in the world. 
Thanks to Photoshop. I'm just kidding. Uh, Photoshop on that one. Agate's about this big, but. <laughs> then we have Detroit Agate, called Fordite. You notice these little slabs are 50 bucks a piece. That's not a real agate, but now this stuff is, this is from the paint booths in the auto factory. So the paint would accumulate and sometimes big block of paint, all these different colors. The guy discovered you can cut them with a diamond saw and you can polish them. And now it's real expensive stuff. Ford agate or Detroit agate. But some of the best agates are very expensive. And a friend of mine bought this one for 18000 It's It's big, it's beautiful, nearly flawless. And this friend I ran into in Tucson, he's from uh, Amsterdam, and he was thinking about buying it. I had to find out from the other guy who bought that agate, but this guy paid for this agate, $40,000. That, that's the top line. Let's look like anything else, whether it's stamps or coins or beer cans, the best of the best gets high price. Uh, then we have thunder eggs, which came from these high silica eruptions, like like, said, like, like uh, Mount St. Helens. And you end up with these ice, this uh, ash flow drops, it's basically glass, hot glass embedded in pumice. It comes rushing down the mountain and it coagulates and uh, sometimes it instantly cools and becomes obsidian. And if you have snowflake obsidian, these little pom pom balls, snowflake, those are primordial thunder eggs. Nobody really knows how they form, but then you find these beds of thunder, thunder eggs, they have pressure ridges. They're very strange. Nobody knows how they form. You cut them open, and everyone, every type is different. In current beds, the med bay, the size of this room, or the size of Stevens Point, usually the size of this room is closer, and uh, have certain characteristics. There's another one, the geo, it's a thunder egg, it's a volcanic geo from Mexico. <clears throat> then here's one, Larry Ridley has got a mine in Idaho, and the thunder eggs are, full. these ones are filled with jasper, a beautiful orb jasper that takes a very high polish, and the jewelry, jewelry makers go crazy about this stuff. They'll pay big bucks. But he's trying to pop this sucker open and get the jasper out of it. In the Elgico Mountains of Central Oregon, that's the east of the uh, Cascades, it's the richest thunder eggs uh, occurrence on the planet, at least 100 different kinds. So in one area, you'll find a bed of thunder eggs. There'll be green matrix and blue agate in the center. You go a half mile away, there'll be ones that are yellow matrix and pink in the center. And nobody knows. They're all thunder eggs. There's a minute difference in the chemistry. Nobody knows how they form. Don't, anybody tells you, it'll make me one. When I was a kid, I got a, blue, a classic blue red Friday Ranch thunder egg uh, from near Madras. And that ranch has several different kinds of thunder eggs on it. And some of those thunder eggs are pretty big. This is in Oregon where it's thunder egg country. And down in New Mexico, southern New Mexico, my late friend Paul Coburn, the geo kid, uh, had only Baker Ranch mine. <clears throat> and the edge of the little Florida mountains, these mountains are full of thunder eggs, many different kinds. This is the most famous kind, the color, the beauty, and some of the things I've seen are this big, but most of them are about this big. And all colors of the rainbow and just beautiful. It's about 15 miles from the Mexican border. Then we have sedimentary agates, agates found, not found not in not as thunder eggs and not in volcanic rock, but in limestone. And uh, we have one called Tipe Canyon agate, and the agates in the Black Hills and the Badlands and the, the grasslands that are found in limestone. Nobody knows how they form, except for one guy in Appleton who wrote book, he's a graduate of UWSB. Well, what happened is uh, all these creeks leading off of the Black Hills eroded these agates out of the limestone, deposited them by the Cheyenne River in the area near Hermosa, South Dakota, the, gra the grasslands. They're very rare agates. If you find one, you're very lucky. And then there's a dry head agate from Montana, also a sedimentary agate on the limestone. And the duck. This is uh, Kentucky egg. The duck, now I can't talk Kentucky. And then uh, Layman, he, he worked for uh, a machining firm in uh, Oshkosh. But he's got the accent. He called it the duck. It's a duck. And uh, I took him to Germany. He met some friends who wanted, said, I want to buy the duck. And 
ten thousand dollars, not enough for the duck. He didn't sell the duck. No, he still got the duck. But uh, anyway, the Kentucky egg is another uh, sedimentary egg, and they, a lot of them are uh, mustard yellow with black and blue. They're beautiful, I think. And then we have Central Wisconsin egg. I found this walking out of a restaurant years ago. The agate isn't very big. This is the biggest one I ever found. I found it across the street at Century World about five years ago. But if you look around, you see a lot of orange, uh, jasper, calcedony chert, and sometimes you find little agate patterns. So that's Wisconsin oogolitic. And if you look real closely, you see these oogolites, little particles. They're on a fo around fossils or particles, and there'll be other structures in there. A couple more agates from that are sedimentary, the puma agate from Argentina, and the dull coat agate from England. And then we have vein agates that form in big voids and veins. This is the biggest schlock bit Saxony agate. Uh, that's a vein agate. So it doesn't occur in a nodule or a thunder egg, it's in a vein. Another one is the Orphei agate from Bulgaria, very, very beautiful. And we have crazy lace agates that replace calcite. All right, have you seen enough rocks? Good. All right, so we have lights. I'll uh, show you a couple things here. Okay. Actually, uh, let's, let me turn. Have you turn the lights off just for a minute? I'm gonna, I got to show something in there. Pause like that. One of the things you can do. Let me see. Do the safety thing here. You can uh, get into his uh, fluorescent minerals. This is from Franklin, New Jersey. It used to be a zinc mine there. Wilmite, Franklinite, and zincite. <coughs> the most famous fluorescent material in the world. Let's see if it works. Oops. Oh, it's in the sun. It's in the sun. <laughs> And if you go to the mine there, it doesn't, it's not operating anymore. They have a whole hallway tunnel with this stuff in it and better keep the lights on. This, by the way, is scapolite and it fluoresces. It's just a dull uh, white, but when you put the shortwave UV on it, it fluoresces. So this one is a uh, egg from Mexico. Well, you can't see it. A lot of this stuff turns green, and if it was darker here, you can see the green. Anyway, that's that's uh, one way you can tell some things, things apart. This is the kind of radiation that you don't want to look at. Turn this. I don't want to turn this up to my eyes. It burn my retina. Out. This is the stuff that gives you skin cancer. So um, you got to be careful with it. You know, it's not to give you skin cancer for two seconds, but it's a short way of the right question. Um, the tile back there was turning blue. Oh, was it? Okay, so there's good, good observation. A lot of things fluoresce. Uh, I was gonna, since you mentioned the tile, I was going to show you. Uh, the Sparkling iron ore from the Beacon Hill mine in Champion, Michigan. We went there years ago, and it used to be tons of stuff. In a bright sunny day, you almost blind you. It sparkles. But that's a, it's a iron ore. It's heavy, right? Pretty heavy. And here's the streak. I hope this works. No, it's kind of red. It's supposed to be red. <laughs> that's the deal, right? Iron ore turns red, when, so you're powdering it. So that's another way you can tell these things apart. Let me get this going. Okay. The other thing I was going to show you, which is safer to do with soda pop or something like that. But uh, the, uh, I have two rocks here. Okay, I have three rocks, four rocks. Okay. These two rocks look alike. Don't they? Come up like it. One of them is kind of chalky. It's softer. That's limestone. I know it, but we're going to test it. This one is actually a lot harder. It's a quartzite, but it looks like the limestone, okay? So one way you can tell apart, well, you can play, use, the, use the knife. And the knife will not scratch the quartz. 
it will certainly scratch the limestone. And the quartz will actually scratch the, the knife. Okay, that's one way. This is another type of limestone here. This is marble. What's the difference between limestone and marble? <coughs> Sweet. So you take limestone, heat and pressure, and it turns to marble. Very good. Uh, anyway, I got some. I went to Fleet Farm and got some acid. Let's see, we get the gloves in the whole nine yards here. I got a doctor's appointment tomorrow morning. <laughs> okay, so uh, I got a little acid. Try it on the quartz. Nothing. Nothing. No bubbling, no nothing. Because it doesn't react with quartz. Because of the chemistry. Let's try it on the limestone and see if that works. Bubbling. Now it's bubbling. You can't see it very well, but it's bubbling and fizzing and giving out carbon dioxide. It'll do the same thing on this limestone here. Sure, yeah, wait to see what you can do. see the bubbles here. See the bubbles? That's myriad acid. From the sweet farm, I get some from a little plug there. And we put it on, put it out. So we put it on the marble. Marble is basically limestone and amorphous with bubbles. So it's a little test you can do. You can use, you can use soda pop to get some similar results. And a lot of times you don't have to go this far, but when we try to figure out what something is, we try to use our detective skills. Okay. Uh, okay. Thank you. <laughs> Let me get this uh, thing out of the way here. I don't want anybody to get acidified or whatever. Okay. Door prizes. You have the bucket? Bucket? Yeah. Now, I would urge you, if you're the winner of a door prize, don't take five minutes to pick because we've got a lot of door prizes and not enough time and a lot of people, all right? Maggie, you want to do the honors? How many do you want me to pull? Just pull one for one at a time. Okay. Mike Griffith? Okay. All right, Mike. And back there, you get your choice of any one item. With the exception of the smell, right? There's two pieces of smell, right? Take them both, all right? If that's what you want. All right, go ahead and pick another one, Megan. Got some young handwriting here. <laughs> Samara. All right. All right. And next up. Kathy Krupa. All right. <laughs> Good for you. Your lucky day. <laughs>
choice. Put that in the light, that sparkle by crazy to blind me. Alright, we'll keep going. Uh, we have got Jeremy Ray, right? Thank you. 